Hi everyone, welcome along to New Zealand Grassland Association's 82nd conference and I think the first that we've ever done virtually. So this is a bit of an experiment for grasslands, but uh, thank you for joining us. I see we're um, 60 or 70 already online and no doubt more coming in. The team will be letting those of you that are, that are still to join in. Um, hopefully you can all hear me at the other end. Um, it was working just a moment ago. I'm Aaron Meikle. I'm just going to be facilitating keeping us to time today as we tick along. It is a fairly tight um, time frame, so we will be ticking things along. And the first thing I'm going to do is, if, Laura, if you could put up the, the screen for Slido, please. During this, you'll be able to put in questions. Um, we'd prefer it if you use Slido, which a few of you that have been to the conference will have seen the, the tool in use. So you can use the camera on your phone, hold it up to that QR code there and, and join, hashtag NZGA, or you can go straight to slido.com and, and join there again using that hashtag. So that'll let you um, put questions in during the speakers. And then we're gonna have some Q and A sessions at a couple of stages during the conference. But while you're doing that, we're going to have a question come up in just a minute. And what we want you to do, we'll give, leave that up for a couple of minutes just so you can all get joined in. Um, first thing we want to know, just to test that it's working, is to put in whereabouts you're joining us from today. Just the location, doesn't have to be too precise, like um, your office or your bedroom, but um, just whereabouts in the country you are. And while you're all doing that, and we're checking that it's working, to save time, I'm going to hand straight over to the president of the Grasslands Association, who I think um, most of you will know, Warren King, who's going to just say a few words of, of welcome on behalf of the association. So hopefully you're still with us, Warren. And here I am. Thanks, Aaron. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Kia ora tato. Uh, I'm, uh, it's my privilege uh, as president of the New Zealand Grasslands Association to welcome welcome you to this, our 82nd uh, conference and the very first um, conference we've ever held online. Uh, it's uh, in a year of, of precedence. This is pretty exciting for us. We were, of course, due to be in Invercargill. And I note um, uh, with, with some sense of irony that the weather in Invercargill this week has been absolutely perfect. And I'm sure it'll be absolutely perfect when we are there in 12 months time as well. Um, this online event, um, still will deliver to our purpose. And just to remind you uh, of that, it's to foster progress and encourage collaboration in all matters relating to grassland. Um, given that this is uh, uh, our very first online conference, we've decided to mix it up a little bit. It's a, a mixed mode event. So there's a mixture of, uh, of uh, live presentations, some recorded presentations, and a couple of sessions of Q and, uh, Q and A as well. Um, and so it, it will give quite a, a different flavor from uh, traditional face-to-face -face, uh, conferences if you have uh, been, to, uh, been to one of those conferences before. Uh, and we hope you enjoy it. We certainly want your feedback in terms of what you think works well and perhaps what you think could have been done better. Um, so afterwards, uh, we'd be very, very keen on getting that feedback. Of course, the, uh, the presentations, in fact, this entire 90-minute slot will be made available for, uh, for viewing on our website uh, in due course, uh, as, along with the, the papers as well, of course. Um, look, I just want to, um, just before I go, to hand back to Aaron, um, there, are, there are three three lots of people I really want to specific, uh, specifically thank because without any of these uh, three people, uh, these three groups, um, this none of this would be possible. So the first is to say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, many of our uh, sponsors we have enjoyed long lasting relationships with and we really do appreciate their ongoing support particularly in this difficult time it's not only difficult for us um, obviously it's been a, a, a very much a, um, an unpredictable year for all of our sponsors as well so uh, we really do appreciate your support of course um, thanks also to the members uh, members themselves so um, I, we're here for you um, without you we have no purpose so um, I would like to encourage you to uh, take a moment and renew your membership uh, if you have not already done so. Um, again, without that, without uh, your ongoing support, uh, we can't do what we do. Uh, and lastly, um, a really big thanks to Beef and Lamb New Zealand uh, for providing this technology platform and for holding our hands while we go through this process, particularly to Laura, Brian, and uh, Briar, sorry, and of course to, um, oops, uh, Briar, and of course to, uh, to Aaron. Um, we, we appreciate that there is, that these online sessions are not without risk. So um, buckle up people, it could be uh, an interesting next 90 minutes. 
Thank you. And over to you, Aaron. Thanks, Warren. Let's see if you thank me at the end. We'll see how this goes. Hey, look, um, I see quite a few comments coming in the chat. Thank you very much. We are going to try and use Slido if at all possible. So um, I'll get Laura. Can you just stick it up again, please? There's the QR code on there, or you can type in the um, a web address there and join. And that just lets us um, a, keep things a bit aggregated. But as you know, Slido has the feature where you can upvote other people's questions. So we get an idea for what the, the most popular ones are. And we're going to try another wee one, just a poll. Laura, if you could skip through to the one about um, the Invercargill conference, please. So what we're going to try here, we're just a quick um, poll to give you an idea how they work is let us know if you're on Slido, and this won't work in the chat, so don't bother trying, whether you're gonna to go to the conference in Invercargill if we'd held it physically. Yes, no, maybe some of it, maybe not, just to see whether we're getting a different audience. Hopefully you should all see that racing across there. Nice, I know we are getting to a few of you who weren't gonna make it, so that's good to know. Look, um, we will keep moving on. Now, what we're going to do is go through the speakers and not have questions during them, but Slido will be open. Stick your questions in. If you see a question you like, vote it up. You'll see a wee thumbs up button, I think, there. And then in, once we've been through the first three speakers, we'll come back to those and we'll go through those questions and, and put them to our speakers. But without further ado, looking at the time, I'm going to move on now to our, our first speaker. Um, I think a number of you, all of our speakers today are the ones where you can say, look, they need no introduction, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, Mike Peterson was New Zealand's Special Agricultural Trade Envoy. I know uh, where I first met him, he was chairman of Beef and Lamb New Zealand. But I think the thing with Mike, and he'll probably talk about it, is first and foremost, he's always been a farmer and he represents farmers' interests um, wherever he may go. So, hey, thanks for joining us, Mike. Um, if this is going to work, you're going to share your screen and we're going to hand over to you to hear from you for the next 10 minutes. Thanks, Aaron. And I'll just uh, start sharing and we'll go from there. Um, there we go. Working. Wonderful. <clears throat> Excellent. So look, um, thanks very much, Aaron. And thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. As you said in your introduction, uh, I always say that I first and foremost am a farmer. Uh, and, uh, and I want to keep it that way. Uh, but I do a number of other things as well. Uh, and I have been doing a fair few talks around the country, um, talking about, you know, bringing an international perspective to uh, the future of New Zealand agriculture. And, uh, and it's been quite interesting, a lot of interest around just what the international environment looks like, particularly when it comes to uh, the farming scene at home. So um, I'm going to take you through a presentation where, <clears throat> excuse me, I will talk about uh, my views, I've got about seven points that I think are quite relevant, uh, particularly in today, for uh, New Zealand agriculture to succeed in challenging times. And, uh, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions later on. So first of all, you know, I would, I would put the question to you and say, why does this matter to you? A lot of people talk about the international scene, but does it really matter? Uh, and I think we need to remember that New Zealand producers earn their living from the world, not from domestic New Zealand. The pace of change is uh, incredibly fast. It's only going to get faster. And our farming practices are going to have to evolve and adapt if they don't align uh, with the values and expectations of consumers. And they play an increasingly important role. And I'll talk about that through the presentation today. One of the things that I talk about a lot offshore in particular is the fact that, yes, our farmers are good, but our professional service and support sectors around farmers uh, have equally as much um, uh, contribution to our sector as the farmers themselves. And so um, in my view, they're going to have to really step up to the plate. There's some challenges ahead and uh, they're going to be a key part of success for the, for the farming sector in New Zealand. Um, just a couple of things to just remind you about New Zealand. We're a small country reliant on the world for a living. I, I know I shouldn't have to say this, but with only 5 million people at home, our market's tiny. We export over 90% of what we produce uh, and we do produce a, enough food for about 40 million people. And being an exporting nation, I always say we always have to do more and go further. It's always harder for us in markets. And so we always have to do more and go further. The second point I want to make is that, you know, the consumer really is king, queen and jack. And I know that uh, as far as scientists are concerned, and there'll be a lot on this call, um, this message is difficult to take. But uh, and amongst the population, unfortunately, Science is losing its relevance, impact, and meaning. 
You know, there's a little amount of trust placed in government and big business. Um, and we see a lot of more trust placed in the hands of communities, influences, uh, and other groups of people around all the things I've noted here, standards and sustainability right through to environment and climate change. Uh, the glyphosate argument in Europe is a classic example that might come up in the questioning later on. But we need to make sure and be aware that we are relevant for the consumer. The third point I want to raise is that the pace of change, and I talked about this a bit earlier, is breathtakingly fast um, with new products, new knowledge, new technologies, um, the use of new things to develop new business models. Uh, and this is an example here of a company in, South, uh, in San Francisco uh, called Plenty, uh, the vertical vegetable production with 40 crop rotations a year, right in downtown San Francisco. Um, you know, people are really shaking the tree when it comes to new knowledge and technologies and challenging traditional farming systems, which is gonna make it a bit of a challenge for us. We need to not uh, try and compete against these people, but we need to capitalize on our story, uh, particularly the naturally produced quality products that we have here in New Zealand. Number four, uh, 2020 is a generational tipping point. Um, and in 2020, uh, you know, we saw 31% of the world's populations are millennials and 32% uh, of Gen Z. So 63% of people are in a new generation of thinking. Uh, the millennials, of course, are mobile pioneers, uh, but the Gen Z are mobile natives. And so, uh, again, when we're thinking about taking our products to the world, we need to think about the new audience and the new consumers that we're selling to. And importantly, how smart they are in being able to access and test just what the integrity of our products are. They're values driven, influencer led, uh, and they are very technologically enabled. Number five, um, and I think 2020 was a tipping point for climate change and environmental concerns. And I know that Greta Thunberg on the, on the cover of Time magazine was no surprise to many people. Um, but the consumer expectations are much, much higher in this area now. Uh, and we ignore this at our peril. Uh, I'm a big supporter of the fact we're moving uh, through the um, Zero Carbon Act into uh, zero net emissions from agriculture. Um, it is not the political bodies that are our concern here. Even in the US, where they withdrew from the Paris Accord last week or a couple of weeks ago, on the ground, the consumers and the commercial companies are pushing ahead uh, and really wanting and demanding uh, zero emissions food. Uh, we need to get on this bus uh, and we ignore it at our peril. The sixth um, point I want to make here is just around COVID-19, you know, with a new world order. Uh, we may uh, have seen uh, from Pfizer yesterday uh, a lot of promise around a vaccine, uh, but this is not going to be an easy task. Um, reports today indicate that we're likely to get maybe a vaccine towards the later end of next year, but it's still going to be some time. Uh, but our success in managing the health crisis has been noticed and it has become a beacon for the world. It's enhanced our reputation for tackling difficult challenges and coming out the other side. Uh, we've done that with Mycoplasma bovis as well. And so there are benefits for brand New Zealand, uh, but we need to navigate new ways uh, of doing business in a travel constrained world. And uh, so I think there's a new world order. I think this is a permanent change uh, and not just something that's going to revert back to type once COVID-19 is over. Number seven, I want to talk about just the opportunity as we build back uh, out of um, uh, COVID-19 and some of the challenges. And to tie uh, is a concept that a number of you may have heard about. Uh, and look, I'm raising this because I think you're going to hear a lot more about this in the next year or so. Um, the Tataya framework has come out of the work of the Primary Sector Council. Um, I think it is something that is truly unique. It's something that we can use um, to define our set of practices, our values uh, and behaviours into a unique selling proposition. Uh, there's a lot of talk about regenerative farming, but I think Tataya can be our version of regenerative farming. It doesn't need to be a recipe. Uh, that is one that comes from other countries. We have a chance to define this and then we can also uh, capture some value from the products that we're taking to the world. And so, you know, what, are they, what does this mean when we're talking about the uh, future success of New Zealand agribusiness? Um, well, I said earlier about the ecosystem of professional service and support entities. 
Uh, obviously, the research sector as well. It's a key part of the success of New Zealand as a food exporting and producing nation. Uh, in my view, success is going to require uh, the pursuit of relentless innovation, development of a world-leading environmental footprint, uh, and the packaging of our unique set of values and heritage into a story that engenders trust and respect. Um, very often in New Zealand, we have actually been doing what needs to be done, uh, but one of the things that I think we've missed out on is packaging that into a cohesive story to take to the world. And so in the presentations I've been giving around New Zealand, I've been talking about the future of farming. And, and there's a personal view on this slide, you know, and it's quest there's a couple of question marks after that, because I think the future of farming uh, may be, uh, you know, articulated on this slide. And I'm talking about practices, systems and behaviors uh, that put people at the heart of our priorities, redefine our interactions with the natural world, uh, display true excellence in water kaitiakitanga or guardianship, uh, net zero emissions agriculture, food and fiber, enhanced biodiversity and restoration of natural environments, labor and employment practices focused on well-being, animal welfare practices that withstand public scrutiny, uh, a New Zealand story based on trust, integrity and the safety of our food, farming businesses that genuinely contribute to vibrant rural communities, and then I say profitable and able to sustain intergenerational tenure. And when I put this slide up and I look at all of those things, uh, nothing in there frightens me at all. But this will be a challenge for a number of our farmers. Uh, many of these things are being done already. Uh, and actually, I think that if we want to stay relevant in the world, we are going to have to think about the future of farming through this type of lens. I put profitable at the very end. And I'm not saying that that should be the very last priority or the lowest priority. Um, but increasingly, we're going to see requirements that will mean the points above profitable uh, are the ones that we need to focus on first and foremost. And so I guess that really sort of looks into the science world. And I would say your country needs you around the grasslands grouping here. We have a group of innovators. We have a group of uh, really bright, uh, young and, uh, and, and uh, mature people, let's say, uh, who actually have a huge amount to contribute to the future success of farming. Um, I think we're up for the task. I think the future of farming in New Zealand actually is very exciting. We need to get on the bus. And I actually think that um, this is a future that we can truly believe in uh, and provide uh, a positive future for the next generation of agribusiness people. Thanks, Aaron. Hi, Aaron, you're on mute. <clears throat> I thought now, that might have only been me. Mm. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, well, there you go. Warren might not be so grateful to beef and lamb New Zealand now. So I gave a really good speech and introduction to Suzanne there. Um, it was one of my best bits of work, frankly, but you've all missed it. So we're just going to have to skip straight in. Thanks, Suzanne. You're sharing your screen. If you can um, start your presentation, please. On mute. Um, thanks for that great right. introduction. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, my name is Suzanne Rowe. Um, I work at AgriSearch. Uh, I don't traditionally come to these conferences. Um, I work with ruminant livestock, so I'm very, very dependent on, on grasslands and, and the great work that you do. But um, I've been invited to, to talk a little bit about a, a livestock breeding scheme that I've been involved in uh, that's been running for, for 10 years on breeding for uh, lowered enteric methane emissions and, and how it's being rolled out um, on farm. Um, so um, I probably don't need to tell this audience, but uh, enteric methane emissions are um, basically the um, result of a ruminant uh, fermenting um, complex starches so that they take in um, grasses, uh, ferment the grass with it within the gut and uh, microbes within the gut break down these grasses in, in a fermentation process and produce energy precursors for the animals. So that's um, acetate, propionate and butyrate are the main ones. But these are the energy sources that, that the ruminant then goes on to produce meat, uh, milk and, 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 and for energy for maintenance. Now in, the, in this process, um, hydrogen ions are, are released 
and they've got nowhere to go. So we have ancient bacteria called archaea or methanogens, and they soak up these hydrogen ions and, and they, they um, throw them out of the front end, not the back end, the front end um, as methane. So enteric methane emissions in ruminants is, is, is purely a waste product of breaking down uh, grass and, and feed uh, to provide energy for the animal. Obviously a very important um, waste product because the animal needs, needs, needs to get rid of it. Uh, but uh, the, the main message for, um, for us is that 44% of New Zealand's greenhouse gas emissions are methane and 80% of those are enteric methane. So around a, a third of our greenhouse gas profile is actually from methane released from ruminants. Um, and we've signed up to the Paris Agreement. So that's 50% um, by uh, 2047. So we, we've, we've signed up to, to reduce our, our, our commitments. And given that this is a, such a huge proportion of, of the greenhouse gases, we can't actually escape that, that livestock will need to do something or livestock producers will need to do something about their, their footprint. Uh, so 10 years ago, um, a man called John McEwen set up a, a program where he took uh, sheep from around the country. Uh, this was purposeful. This was done so as the, the sheep that were measured were uh, representative of the, of the New Zealand breeders flock. And he measured them over a series of years through respiration chambers. And he chose the, the high emitters and the low emitters. And he developed two selection lines. And the purpose of this was purely to see if we could breed sheep to either emit less methane or more methane than, than the average sheep, and to see if it got passed on from one generation to the next. And to cut a long story short, that program was very successful. Uh, methane emissions are heritable, so there is some form of host control. And currently the lines are in good health. They uh, diverge by an average of around 11%. Um, and if I took the, the ram that produced the, the offspring with the highest methane and the ram with the offspring with the lowest methane, I'd see around 25% difference. Um, so successfully uh, diverging as a, as, as a strategy to lower methane. This has been tested uh, on, on pasture. That, so one, one of the, the main challenges that we face with these um, uh, breeding schemes is, is how do we actually evaluate and measure things and prove things on, on grazed grass. So um, Arjun Jonker, at grasslands spent a long time cutting pasture and, and feeding animals in respiration chambers to actually test whether the lines were different on cut pasture as well as the pelleted feed that they um, inevitably fed in, in a sort of restricted chamber basis. And um, again, um, the, the pasture at different times of year and different seasons uh, successfully showed that the animals ranked differently. So then the next stage in this process was to actually look and see what, what this meant in terms of uh, livestock production in New Zealand. Uh, there was very little point in, in breeding an animal that didn't sit within the, the current system and wasn't profitable. Uh, this is a maternal worth index. So this is gross margin in cents uh, per breeding view. So um, up here is, is, is cents uh, and, and along here we've got, got years and this blue line is the average flock in New Zealand. So they're, they're tracking along and, and, and each year we see an improvement in the, in the gross margins. This orange line is uh, uh, an elite research flock. So uh, that's being bred to really perform well um, and is that much higher than the average. And these lines here, this red one, is uh, the high methane emitting flock and this green one is the low methane emitting flock. And what we can immediately see is that the low methane, low methane flock, despite being only selected for methane emissions, it's not selected on any other um, traits at all. So they're measured, but, but, but not selected for. In actual fact is, is following the, um, the, the high um, production flock really closely. Um, and when we look a bit closer at this, what we see is that uh, lean lamb growth in, in the low line is, is actually um, higher than the high line. Uh, parasite resistance is better uh, and wool growth is, is higher. So um, this, this was a surprise. This wasn't something that we necessarily expected. And obviously that they're, they're, they're from a, a sort of narrow genetic base. So there could be some founder effects in here, um, but, but I, th I think in general, what we're seeing is uh, the impact of, of this room and fermentation being driven uh, in, in two different directions by breeding for high and low methane. 
So um, we have two separate lines that, that we can look at and they have 11% less methane per unit of feed eaten. Uh, they also have smaller rumens. So they have 20% smaller rumens when we look at them in a CT scanner, um, but they have the same surface area. When we actually take those rumens and measure the papillae and look at the surface area of the rumens, uh, they actually have slightly more surface area than, than, than the highs. They have a fermentation which is propionate dominant. Um, and this basically means that they have less short chain fats and they, they lay down fat differently, which is why we get these sort of um, fast, faster growing lean lambs um, and, and a slightly different energy profile in the meat. So um, from a very, very simple selection program, selecting on a single trait that looked to be a very environmentally uh, noisy trait, what we've actually done is, is, is really change the physiology of the animals in, in just under a couple of generations. But what we have seen is that methane can be passed on to the next generation. We haven't seen any detrimental side effects. Um, there's a potential to lower absolute emissions in the national flock if we roll it out. And it's accountable, it's measurable. Uh, if we actually rank rams and, and provide a, a breeding value to breeders, then, then we can actually give farmers the ability to um, have an impact on their own enteric emissions um, at, at the farm gate. So, um, that's basically where we've been sitting. We've been rolling it out to farm and we've been doing this um, with the help of funding from the Pastoral Greenhouse Gas Consortium and in collaboration and conjunction with, with Beef and Lamb New Zealand. So at AgriSearch, we have a set of mobile units that we can measure sheep on any farm. Uh, so we can roll up to, to the farm gate and actually measure animals on farm. And if we do this uh, in our own flocks, what we're seeing is that um, if we uh, include methane into our maternal index. So rather than uh, have a maternal index and, and, and choose sons based on only production, if we include methane, we lose about, we lose about a dollar of gross margin um, on, on the productivity. And we need to uh, value methane at about $100 to get that dollar back. But um, if, if we just look at the, the physical changes, if, if we ignore methane completely and just breed as we're going, uh, we see about a 1.7% increase in, in methane year on year, or, or sorry, generation on generation. Um, but if we include methane and we say this is part of our selection goal, and we're going to include that within our index and, and use it to rank animals, then we actually see a 3.7% uh, reduction per generation. So um, the numbers are stacking up reasonably well for breeding to be a, a, a good tool. And as I've said, the, the, the way that this is being implemented on farm is that um, we've uh, joined forces with Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Uh, they have the, the Sheep Improvement Limited system now becoming Improve. And what we've been able to do is to actually implement measurements um, and provide breeding values, genomic breeding values to any breeder uh, that, that has the, the, the animals measured or has genotypes in, in, the, in the SIL system. Now, as I've said, um, we've been really well supported by the, the PGGRC or the Pastoral Greenhouse Gas Research Centre and, and they're helping us at the moment because in order to do this and in order to provide good predictions that are accurate and useful, we need to measure enough representative animals to um, have, a, have a good training set and a, and a good database. And uh, given the, the structure of the New Zealand industry, we, we've assessed that we probably need around 10,000 animals measured. Um, and basically we're, we're, we're rolling that out on farm. I'm, I'm gonna go quickly through these slides because I don't wanna hold anybody up, but we're measuring two and a half thousand animals per year that are representative of the national flock uh, that have got good records. Um, they, they've got good DNA um, information and, and, and are available to take up this industry support package. And actually anyone can have their sheep measured. So, um, this www.methanebv.co.nz um, is, is a form and anyone can apply to have their sheep measured um, for, for methane emissions. And the uptake has been really, really great. Uh, we've got lots of breeders on board right across the country who are really interested, really want to know how their animals rank, what their methane status is, and prepare to plan as to what they might do about their own uh, individual profiles. So as, as, as Mike says, many people out there are, are already uh, positioning themselves to make sure that um, they take advantage of, of, of any advances in technology that, that we can offer. 
and this is this is true globally. So uh, we're part of the Global Research Alliance, and we're part of a program called uh, Grass to Gas, which is eight members from seven different countries. Uh, we've exported the chambers that we use in New Zealand around the world. Uh, this is Uruguay. Uh, this is a set of chambers in Norway. This is a set in Ireland. So um, our global counterparts are looking to us uh, for, for help, for advice. Uh, they're using our technology and, and they're joining with us to make sure that the program that we have gives, uh, gives really accurate predictions so that globally we make a difference. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really great uh, system to be able to see that happening. So see the last um, slide, please. Yep, this is, my, this is my last slide. So genetic progress is, is, is possible, but the physiology and the economic outcomes are, are actually very complex. We don't see any major targets for things like gene editing in, in, in these um, difficult livestock traits. Uh, so at the moment, we are looking at uh, conventional breeding systems. Uh, we see changes in the rumen. Um, we see morphological changes, uh, which are noisy and complex, but, but we are seeing success and we are looking to um, take this further. And we're currently engaged in uh, looking at 10,000 ruminants uh, for, for various production environment disease status um, challenges. So, um, yeah, um, I agree with Mike, the, the, the future for, for New Zealand livestock breeders um, is it is very bright and it's very technical and, and and there's much much going on in this area so i'll wrap up there awesome thanks suzanne and i know i'm unmuted this time but thank you very much to the person who can remain anonymous who said they thought i was better muted i'll talk to you later but in that we will keep moving on because we are uh, thanks to my hiccup and we're slightly over time so we're going to hand over and excellence up there already to somebody who i think literally needs no introduction so i won't but i'm really looking forward to this presentation because the title certainly caught our eye so thank you looking forward to hearing about a new generative agriculture jacqueline thank you very much aaron and it's new generative agriculture one of my favorite topics because it's based on science, informed by research and honed by farmers, all of us working with all of you. And we've already heard from Mike, who set the scene brilliantly, that the farming practices in New Zealand must align with, with the values and expectations of our consumers, our customers overseas. And what we're being told by our processors and marketers is that regenerative agriculture has swept the world. And that places like Cargill's, the big grain company, are helping their growers become regenerative. They're in America. They have the Dust Bowl soils. We hear that Danone is ensuring that they are regenerative and are doing the carbon neutral thing by planting trees. And we hear that Walmart looks for an RA tag and is expecting all its suppliers to do better. And so we, as some scientists, are a bit concerned because if you're already very good, what does getting better mean? And we are concerned that some of the tools being promoted at the moment will actually erode our efficiencies. So what are we trying to achieve? I don't think anybody has any qualms about wanting an even better environment or an even more vibrant economy or being stronger in terms of resilience or having better well-being. Though I drop into the conversation and thinking that the United Nations declared that New Zealand regarded it well ranked as the eighth happiest country in the world. And this was announced in October. And moving from eighth to seventh is quite a challenge really. All the top ones are in the Scandinavian countries. So we need to do some research there to see what they're doing is di that's different. But when I look at those environment, economy, resilience and well-being aspects, they actually match up very well with the sustainable development goals. Preserving environmental resources, nurturing communities, driving prosperity in the economy, and all of that is based on sustainable food systems. We know that sustainability is context driven and what some of the things that are being proposed for overseas might not result in what is expected here. So we need to know the starting point, the comparisons that are being made, the concerns about current practices, the facts, evidence and data supporting those concerns, remembering concerns from America or Australia might not be the same for here, and also consider whether 
what alternatives are being discussed, would they be more acceptable or would there be unintended consequences? We know. Regenerative agriculture with all its different types of definitions is biodiversity driven. We're looking for ecological synergies and we want components of the agri-system, agro-ecosystem to be flourishing. Soil health is a focus, which brings joy to my heart as a soil scientist. Increasing organic matter. We know that we've got quite a lot. Decreased disturbance, all the things that we've been hearing about, the plant and animal nutritive quality, reducing stresses on stock animals and reducing dependence on agricultural chemicals. And when we look at the New Zealand context, we do have soil or high soil organic matter three times what is being promoted as achievable by moving from run out cropping to uh, mob stocked animals, for instance, in Florida. And that means also because we're mostly moist soils, high biological activity. And we make the most of that replenishing and utilizing, not losing nutrients from our soils. Part of our high biological activity is because we have really low chemical inputs into our pastoral systems. Remember that most of the concerns come out of um, arable cropping. We've got a low nitrogen footprint. Stu Ledgard's research and indeed his Grassland Trust Memorial Trust talk showed that when, in particular, when we work with dairy beef, we have a low nitrogen footprint per kilo of meat, and we've got a low greenhouse gas footprint. Dairy alone, which accounts for a quarter of the um, biological gases, will feed over 1% of the global population for less than 0.05% of the greenhouse gases. That's a fantastic achievement. But what our consumers want? Well, our consumers in New Zealand want reduced impact per hectare. But what our overseas consumers want is a reduced impact per mouthful. That is quite, quite different. And though we're being told that research is necessary to prove it, we know from one of the gurus on regenerative agriculture, that is Terra Genesis International, that everything is built on a strong history, a strong foundation of research in organic research, agroecological, bioecological research. And we look at the data. Clark and Tillman did a really good comparative piece showing per mouthful, we do have more impact on the environment going organic and by implication regenerative through Derogenesis International. And is that what we're really trying to achieve, given that we've got more and more people in the world? We also know that we won't be getting a premium unless pretty much there is some sort of consumer guarantee. And we've already heard from the organics people over Christmas, the cost of auditing is very high and they have to pay it. But it's the resilience and well-being one that I get concerned about in the rural community. And there is certainly data on this, but remember we're the eighth happiest country in the world. And the resilience uh, it is based on having a stable income, but the Australian data said it was always low, whereas the people who were not considered to be regenerative, but were managing their property, uh, had some good years amongst the less good, and well-being was self-reported. These regenerative graziers reporting higher well-being also reported higher financial stress, but they were being supported and felt they could achieve their goals and they were doing a good job. And that is a very important message for all of us as rural professionals. How can we support, just as Mike said, our farmers? Because every single aspect of all parts of life can pretty much always do better, but we need to be sure that what we're encouraging is actually going to lead to the goals that we had imagined. Can we get better by adopting the principles being proposed by regenerative agriculture? Well, certainly some areas we can look at soil health, certainly some times of the year, we can achieve better pasture management with appropriate moving of stock, which they call adaptive paddock management, as we might call rotational grazing. But more particularly for me, I'm trying to think which goals are appropriate and how we can evaluate a market position so that we can be the leaders that we've always been for the world in terms of pastoral-based agriculture. 
And indeed, it may well be that Mike just gave us the answer. And it might be to Tayo, which I would have put at the bottom of the slide, except that I hadn't heard him say this before. And it's beyond me on this technology to do that sort of alteration on the run. There's more and more of information being passed around about this. We are going to have the video and then papers on the grassland.org. I've spelt that incorrectly, sorry, grassland. There are also some material on ag science. The two groups are working very closely together to get as much scientific information out there as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. So we've caught up some time. Um, sorry if there's a bit of background noise from me, because I know I'm unmuted, but also outside my window, my neighbour is just shifting a mob of using lambs. Looks like he's had a first draft. So there's some weaned lambs making a bit of noise. So we've got some questions come in. There's a chance for you to still go on Slido and upvote them. We haven't got a lot of time, so I'm going to basically try and put one question to each of our speakers. Um, Mike, if you're online, the first question that's come in, and it's the top voted one, is for you. It's just saying you assume a high value story business model. What if the USA and Europe are crashing economically and Asia becomes stronger, destroying our high value markets? What will happen? Well, Aaron, um, we're assuming that there aren't high value consumers in Asia that are prepared to pay for a story. And in fact, there are. And that's becoming increasingly obvious, um, particularly with um, the access that many of those consumers have got through to cell phones. So. Um, I, I think that we um, ignore the fact that, you know, the exporting uh, companies from New Zealand have actually done a phenomenal job and COVID-19 has showed just how much uh, they've learned uh, in diversifying markets and being able to, I know it's a terrible word at the moment, pivot uh, away from where COVID-19 is affecting people. So uh, when COVID-19 hit in China and in the end of January, you know, those Europe and USA markets were particularly strong. Uh, and we managed to divert away to there. When, when uh, um, the USA and Europe uh, was hit, then we've gone back into Asia. So I'm very, very confident there's a high value story in most of the markets of the world we've diversified into. Brilliant, thanks Mike. Um, Suzanne, we're gonna have a, a question for you and, and see how we go. But this is quite an interesting one. Um, you're talking there about sheep breeding. How easy would it be to replicate the sheep breeding research with the dairy industry? Um, are they at the same stage? Has any work been done? So there's 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 lots of work being done. Uh, they're not at the same stage purely because it's much more difficult to to measure uh, a cow than a sheep. Uh, so we do have respiration chambers, but a, a much smaller number. Uh, but there's work with uh, the dairy companies uh, and new technologies coming online to to measure cattle. So all of the results from the sheep will be used to inform the dairy progress. And at the moment, pretty much all of the investment is in transferring and developing the, the technology in dairy so we can basically bring them up to the same um, speed. Okay, so there's the, the same opportunity is expected to be there for, for dairy cattle? Very much so. The heritabilities are the same. Um, or very similar so yeah there's and and in actual fact the way that the industry is set up they could probably take advantage of um, breeding technology much more quickly than than the sheep sector because the the the, the sheep sector is much more diverse so um, yeah given given the opportunity and um, you know the the economic need need there to to actually select on on the trait then there's no reason why they can't can't take it up but it but it, it will involve sort of four to five years of, of, of development and, and investment before they're in the same space. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Jacqueline, this one's a, a reasonably simple one, but you might want to expand a bit on, on what else is happening. We've talked about the application of principles from overseas to us. Who are our global producer competitors in the sustainable ag space? Uh, Ireland says they are. It is. An awful lot of that is self-supported. But most people um, cannot do what we are doing in terms of pasture-based, uh, free-range, high animal welfare. Remember, that was one of Mike's points, but we have an A grade according to the international system. Only UK, Austria and Switzerland have an A grade as well. Antibiotics, they don't like that. Well, we're the third lowest user of um, animal antibiotics in the world. So we can make all these good statements. Just to clarify, we're at something like nine milligrams active ingredient per kilogram, nine your micrograms. Uh, Italy's at 
Thank you. So, <laughs> but Aaron, that we're really good. Point. Yeah, Mike. There's, there's an there's an important point there, though, Aaron, is that um, Jacqueline's exactly right in that um, there are relatively few competitors that can claim our sustainability and animal welfare credentials, but there are plenty that try to. Uh, whether, yeah. they're true, whether they're true or not, that's, that's a different story. But there are plenty that, tr that claim they are as good. Yes, and so that becomes how do you audit? And we know because we saw this with the, um, the footprinting things what, a decade ago, the minute you say, and here's New Zealand's data, we're even better, they change their accounting system so that we're not. Mm. And I'd hate us to get sucked down that path because I remember all the organics people weeping and wailing in their um, fields because they couldn't pay for their new accreditation system. Um, Suzanne, actually on the same angle, um, any of this work being done overseas or any of our, our competitors, I guess, um, trying to, to follow the same angle or had any progress with it? Yeah, very much so. Um, and in actual fact, um, the Global Research Alliance means that we're all working together. So um, we aren't competing, we're, we're collaborating at the moment. Uh, so it's uh, in terms of the science, um, we're, all, we're all pushing to, to move forward together. Great. And this last one, before we go on to our videos, just looking at time, and this is probably one for both Mike and Jacqueline. Um, Around you talked about the impact of COVID nineteen. Um, has it actually had a beneficial effect? Has it changed the trust in scientists because we're looking for um, science based responses? And the recent vaccination has probably emphasised the, the importance of science or, or trust in science. Who wants to answer that one? Well, I well, would I'll say start. right as yeah. a start. The really good news is that the warm feelings for farmers in New Zealand increased hugely during the COVID time. So that the battling that the farmers were doing, well, yes, we were told it was a privilege and we regarded it like that, but we also had to do a heap of things that cost more, took longer, and we went on milking the cows and drafting the sheep. So that is already in the uh, literature. The, there's been a bit of a bifurcation, I think, with the um, with COVID, because we did have people trying bleach, even in New Zealand, and we did have somebody set up on the hierarchy plane selling special stuff, and people were still buying it. Mm. But with any like mm. now we've got the vaccine, if that's shown to work, then yes, people will start beginning to trust it again, and maybe the anti-vaxxers, if they're desperate, will actually take it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and look, I think, Aaron, I think the point is, is, is actually quite important. I think that, you know, COVID-19 could be an opportunity for people to actually, re, you know, review re their faith in science, and that would be really good. But, yeah, we just can't ignore the fact, you know, when I'm in Europe and I'm talking to people over there and we're talking about the fact that they will ban the use of glyphosate in 2023, um, and, um, and I talk to them about it and they say, Mike, um, you know, I say, look, the science proves that glyphosate can be used perfectly safely amongst people. And the politicians say to me, Mike, you don't understand. The science is irrelevant in this discussion. The people have spoken, you know, and it is a frightening, frightening thing. So um, there are vast tracts of people around the world uh, that still don't trust science. And, um, and that's, we need to try and restore that. COVID-19 might help. Brilliant. Thank you all. And they trust so we... New Zealand more because of the way we dealt with it. So thank that's you all. an important aspect. We'll keep moving. So thank you all very much for your input and for that last comment. Um, but on that note, on Mike's note, we're actually about to talk about some more science. So what we've got coming up now, um, touch wood, it's all going to work. It worked perfectly just before we started, but then I remembered to unmute my line before we started too. There's a couple of recorded videos that we're just going to play showing some of the, the presentations that you would have seen at, at Invercargill otherwise. So now I'm going to share my screen. I was going to share my screen. What's happened? There we go. You should now see a video. And if we've done it right, you'll hear the sound as I press play. I am Chris Smith, and together with my colleague Ross Monaghan, have been measuring the leaching losses under fodder beet and kale crops in southern Southland. We have been investigating losses from autumn harvesting of fodder beet by either grazing it in situ or lifting it and feeding it elsewhere as well as comparing losses from winter grazed fodder beet and winter grazed kale. We have done this using porous ceramic cups installed at a depth of 60 centimetres in a crop paddock 
containing both fodder beet and kale plots, as well as three pasture paddocks on the southern dairy hub. The autumn lifting and grazing occurred in mid-May, with the grazing being done by cows, which were placed on the plots for one to two hours in May. This grazing time was sufficient for the cows to achieve the three kilograms of fodder beet that was allowed as part of their daily feed allocation at that time. The winter grazing occurred in late June, with cows from a fodder beet herd being placed on the fodder beet plots for 24 hours, while the next day the cows from a kale herd at Southern Dairy Hub were placed on the kale plots again for 24 hours. In both cases the cows received baleage as per their normal allocation. In autumn, the daily diet of the animals was predominantly pasture, together with the three kilograms of fodder beet and one kilogram of baleage per cow. For the animals in winter, the daily diet was predominantly crop, with the remaining portion of their daily requirements being supplied by baleage. In terms of animal nitrogen intake, we can see that in autumn, nitrogen intake was from the pasture dominated the cow's daily intake of nitrogen to a slightly greater extent than the dry matter inta intake would indicate. This is a reflection of the higher pasture nitrogen compared to the crop and baleage. Similarly, the lower nitrogen content of fodder beet meant that in winter, despite similar dry matter intakes, the nitrogen intake of the cows grazing fodder beet was about half that of the cows grazing kale. In terms of leaching losses, the autumn fodder beet treatments gave relatively high losses of about 100 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare with no difference between the two treatments. These high losses are a reflection of the long period of fallow bare soils over the winter early spring period. The lack of treatment effect indicates that urine deposition was relatively low as a consequence of the short grazing period, with this being overshadowed by the soil mineral nitrogen at that time. At 62 kilograms of hectare of nitrogen, the winter grazed fodder beet leached significantly less than the autumn treatments and approximately half the 119 kilograms of nitrogen that the winter grazed kale leached. In contrast to the high losses of the crop areas, the pastures leached less than 20 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. In conclusion, we can say that autumn grazed fodder beet leaches more nitrogen than winter grazed fodder beet and that lifting fodder beet instead of grazing it in situ has no effect on the amounts of nitrogen leached. Winter grazed kale leaches nearly twice as the amount of nitrogen as winter grazed fodder beet, showing that the use of fodder beet as a winter forage crop can lower end leaching losses. The pasture night leaching losses were low, but were similar to what Overseer modelled for us. Finally, I would like to thank all the knowledge the many workers who contributed to the study and Dairy New Zealand for funding this work. Thank you. Nice, that seemed to work. So now we'll just change over quickly to the next one as I keep sharing my screen. And if it's all going to work, you'll see another one come up. So remember, while we're doing this, Slido is still operational. It is very important to measure nutrient leaching losses in the field for both research and regulatory purposes. Unfortunately, in-field measurement is difficult because leaching is highly variable. Most nutrients are lost from hot spots like urine patches. This is a small area of a dairy pasture. Urine covers a small proportion of the area, often in complex patterns. We need to measure under many urine and dung patches as well as between patches to get an average. How can we do this? We could install 50cm wide column lysimeters in the paddock. These are the gold standard technique for controlled experiments but in the field they are tiny. Each may give high leaching if urinated on or low leaching, so many are needed to get a paddock average and they are simply unaffordable for in-field measurements of end loss. The first common solution is to install an even larger number of smaller, cheaper lysimeters called flux meters, and the other is to install a still larger number of tiny soil solution samplers. In both cases, large numbers of devices are required. Running costs are high as there are many devices to monitor and sample, usually by hand. Also, usually the devices must be accessible from the surface. This means many access tubes in the paddock which complicate cultivation. This paper explores the alternative of using very large 10 metre long transect lysimeters. 
Each device cuts across both urine and non-urine areas. Far fewer devices are required and they are below cultivation depth so do not affect farm management. A simulation study was used to determine how many transect lysimeters would be required to provide similar accuracy to commonly used arrays of flux meters and suction cups. If using 12 flux meters under the conditions simulated in this paper, nutrient leaching would be accurately measured in 49% of years. A single transect lysimeter would give equivalent accuracy to this entire flux meter array. If using 64 suction cups, nutrient leaching would be accurately measured 80% of the time. Only three transect lysimeters are required to achieve this accuracy. If using a larger number of suction cups or transect lysimeters, greater accuracy can be achieved. Now having a smaller number of devices means that it is also possible to cost effectively automate measurements to receive real time data. There is a complication though. Volume is easily measured in real time but laboratory analysis is slow. There is a need for a sensor that can give a real time estimate of nutrient content until lab analysis is available. An electrical conductivity sensor is used but it is affected by many things. Can it predict N? The answer is yes. EC has an extremely strong correlation with total N concentration, making it an excellent predictor of N loss and allowing real time nutrient loss monitoring. Transect lysimeters have equivalent accuracy to existing systems for a lower cost, provide real time data and are field proven. Feel free to contact me to ask any questions you may have. It is very important to measure nutrient leaching losses. Well, that's a trap. It starts itself again. Right, and so we're on to our third video. Look, um, these are working. It's quite a neat way. Congratulations to Samuel, whose video was exactly three minutes, not a second shorter or a second longer. And we're on to our last one. As I said, um, please keep the um, questions coming in on Slido Hi, or voting up ones that are in there. We're going to have a Q&A session with the three presenters from the videos as soon as they're finished. Hi everyone, my name is Roisin Woods and I'll be presenting the findings of some research conducted by Dairy NZ comparing the differences in cow performance between cows wintered on fodderbeet and those wintered on kale. Firstly, I thought I would go through what we actually did and then talk through some of the key findings of the study. So fodderbeet and kale forage crops are an important tool for wintering in the south. Fodderbeet has been rapidly adopted by industry and due to its high metabolizable energy content, high body condition score gains can be achieved. However, over fat cows have an increased incidence of metabolic disease. And some farmers move to ad lib fodder beet feeding to minimise the risk of acidosis. Increasingly, we were hearing that farmers were concerned about poorer than expected performance after calving fodder, following fodder beet feeding. To investigate this, in winter 2017, we conducted a winter feeding trial at the Southern Dairy Hub, comparing winter diets of fodder beet versus kale both diets fed with baleage. We were wanting to try and answer the question whether cows fed ad lib fodder beet would become overconditioned and have poor animal performance in early lactation. So we offered these crops at two allocation rates, target and high. The target offered a maximum of 70% of the diet as crop and we used the Dairy NZ winter crop allocation calculator to determine how much feed was required to achieve pre calf body condition score targets of 5, whereas the high allocation we offered ad lib crop with baleage. I've also included the actual allocations of crop and baleage uh, in the slide just for your information. So there were 82 Frisian cross jersey cows assigned to each of these treatments. The type of crop measurements included crop yields and feed quality. And the type of animal measurements were body condition score, milk production and reproductive performance. Our key findings were that diets with fodder beet were lower in fibre, phosphorus, calcium and sulphur, but had a higher metabolizable energy and sugars compared with kale diets. Cows on the high allocation had greater average weekly body condition score gains pre-calving compared with those on the target allocation but there was no difference between fodder beet and kale. Now here are the pre calve body condition score, um, scores there for each of the treatment groups. Crop type, so fodder beet versus kale, had a greater impact on cow performance than allocation rate. Cows wintered on fodder beet had better reproductive performance, 
So they had a better three week pregnancy rate, better conception to the first artificial insemination and a shorter time from the start of mating to conception compared with the kale cows. In terms of milk production, the fodder beet wintered cows had greater milk solids yield compared with kale cows. Interestingly, we didn't see any differences in fat content or protein content in terms of percentage, so this indicates that it may have been driven by milk volume. So, in summary, winter fodder beet did not reduce cow performance compared with kale in this trial. However, for the majority of the animals used in the study, this was their first winter consuming crop. So, we still don't understand if there are any cumulative effects of feeding fodder beet long term in terms of animal health. So we're keen to investigate this and have a project looking into this at the moment. Thank you very much. Okay, that we've had a few questions come in on Slido. I'm seeing something different on my screen at the moment, so I'm not sure what's, there we go, now you're all back. So if those three speakers are all available, we do have some questions to come in and we have managed to catch up time. So those videos work nicely. Um, Chris, we played your video first, so I'll ask you your question uh, first as well. And it's gone because it was somebody's voted it up. Where did it go? Chris, um, looking at the um, video, uh, your presentation, it appeared that lifted beet still had the same nitrogen leaching as grazing in situ. Is that correct? And if so, why? Yeah, that is correct, yes. Um... The reason why we think is the fact that the cows were only on there for uh, an hour to two hours, so the urine deposition was minimal. They went straight onto the crop from the shed, so their uh, urination frequency was probably less. Plus also there was relatively high soil milling in on both treatments and we felt that that overrided how much urine was deposited. It was the soil mineral in that was being lynched and that was there before the cows went on. Thanks, Chris. Um, Samuel, question for you, a um, bit of interest in the devices. What's the approximate cost of um, buying, installing, operating the devices you were testing? Uh, each one costs, if, if you've used um, column lysimeters before, each one costs a similar amount to put into a col column lysimeter. So you're, you're talking, um, uh, once you put on labor and things, uh, five, six thousand dollars maybe. Um, the the operating cost is about four thousand a year. Um, it that's that's what uh, that, that's what we're running at at the moment. I mean that could change over time, but that's uh, basically when I do the when I've done the sums on uh, in terms of comparable accuracy, it works out to be about a fifth of the cost, sometimes a tenth of the cost of suction cup arrays and flux meters. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, there's one question here. I think. It same for Roisin, but I don't think it quite is. But one, um, Roisin, you talked about the, the maybe cumulative effects, and obviously fodder beet's been used for a long time and in large amounts overseas. Is there any evidence from overseas about cumulative effects from fodder beet on animal health and productivity? You're muted. There we go. Um, I guess that's why we're interested in um, investigating it further. Um, I don't know whether the is strong um, evidence for that. It's more just anecdotal observations from farmers, um, which is why we're interested in looking into it further. It's quite different systems overseas, of course, in terms of how it's fed. And so what's the um, lifespan of your this, this bit of research or how many more seasons you're hoping to go for, or expecting to go for? Um, another, Two years. Okay, cool. Thank you. And uh, Samuel, I'm pretty sure this is one for you. Given the SDH, I presume that's the Southern Dairy Hub comparison has been going for over 18 months. Do you have any comparison results with the suction cups? I presume that's one for you. Uh, well, well, we work, Chris and I will be working on that and you'll see it in the future paper. Awesome. Thank you very much. Right, well, we've managed to um, catch up a little bit of time unless there's any other questions that come in as we go we might move on to the next section in our um, presentation which is if he's there or willing um, John Caritas to, he is there to present the uh, or to discuss and present the New Zealand Grassland Trust Ray Broham Trophy 
for 2020. Great. Thanks, Aaron. John? We will just share the screen, hopefully. How's that? That's working. Excellent. So good, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, each year, the New Zealand Grasslands Trust awards the Rayburn Trophy to a person associated with the pastoral farming industries uh, who has made an outstanding contribution, uh, national contribution over their working career. Uh, this was instituted in memory of Dr. Ray Brown, who was the director of DSI Grasslands from 1970 to 1985. In 2020, uh, the Ray Brown Trophy is awarded to Dr. Gerald Rees. Uh, there we go. Gerald has been uh, the principal science advisor at MPI since 2012. Most recently, he has been providing science and evidence into policy and resource areas of contaminants, climate change, water, forage, land use, nutrients, soils, precision agriculture, and extension and adoption. He has also been providing advice on policies for national science, particularly MB, including National Statement of Science Investment, New Contestable Funds, CRI Core Funding, Funding for Databases and Collections, National Science Challenges, particularly our land and water, regional research initiatives, and proposals, uh, a, a proposal evaluator for the Endeavour uh, MB Fund. Prior to being the principal science advisor, he was the senior scientist, natural resources group at MAF for 12 years. Before that, he worked for the Ministry of Research, Science and Technology in a variety of roles for 10 years, having come from MAF technology, where he was a scientist for 15 years. This background in agricultural research has resulted in Gerald being a strong advocate for value derived from pastoral agricultural research. Gerald is the author of, or co-author of over 170 scientific, technical and conference publications, 11 major departmental reports commissioned and direct supervision of over 250 significant external contracted science reports. Gerald has made an impressive contribution throughout his career to New Zealand science and agriculture and his roles as a research scientist, advisor in R&D funding agencies, and more recently in providing policy advice. He is considered to be the bastion of common sense, science and agriculture by co colleagues at MBI, where his contribution has been recognized with the 2018 Director General Science Prize, acknowledging an exceptional science career. Gerald uh, has also received in 2016 the New Zealand Soil Science Society Lye Grange Medal, as shown in the in the uh, in the photo, this was in recognition of outstanding service to soil science. I'd like you to join with the trust to congratulate Dr. Gerald Bryce as a worthy recipient uh, of the Ray Brown Trophy for 2020. And if I just exit out of here, yes, and hopefully Gerald is online. Gerald with us and can... should be able to join us. There he is. The floor is yours, Gerald. Great. Um, thanks very much, John. I didn't recognise that person you were talking about then, but um, thanks for all those kind words. Look, I'm honoured, but a little surprised at being asked to accept the Ray Brown um, Trophy, but I do thank the Grasslands Trust for this honour. Um, I was a Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries District Agricultural Scientist, being initiated into Grassland Agricultural Science in Taranaki, Manawatu and Hawke's Bay, during Ray's tenure as the Director of Grasslands Division of DSIR. Ray was instrumental in um, continuing to raise the profile of Grasslands Division, both nationally and globally, and being a strong advocate for Grasslands agriculture. And so I'm honoured um, to receive this award in his name. On being informed of receiving the award, I, I looked up the previous recipients and can say that I've studied with, I've worked with, I've communicated with, and had the odd beer even with nearly all of the recipients over the last 10 years. 
Um, I would like to uh, rec also recognise my all early mentors in grassland science, um, Ian Ritchie and the late Bill Kane, who guided me and had faith in me in my early science career. Um, I was surprised and happy that the Grasslands, Grassland Trust had taken a risk basically in presenting the award to somebody who'd taken such a different um, science path to most scientists. My career has been a sequence of thirds. The first third was uh, as a district agricultural field scientist doing applied research. The second third was in dealing with science for agricultural resource policy um, back in math. And the final third has been in providing advice on national um, agricultural science policy. All have involved grassland science to a greater or lesser extent. My latter years have been uh, more in policy and science evidence for policy and in the funding of agricultural science, a very important issue at the heart of most scientists. The topic areas I've, I've covered have been mainly in many and varied, including grassland nutrition, grassland cultivars and species, grassland establishment and management, nitrogen fixation and white clover, uh, the impacts of drought, and more recently, climate change and agriculture, particularly approaches to account for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and also the impacts and adaptation needs for agriculture to climate change. We're now working in a COVID world, um, which has once again highlighted the importance of pastoral agriculture to the country and the economy. It continues to um, strongly support the economy where other major sectors have um, faltered. For example, we can see tourism. Globally, demand for food products, including grassland livestock products, continue to increase with raising, um, rising global population. Um, however, consumer expectations continue to also rise, as does the pro-plant anti-animal product sentiment which continues to grow. The Grasslands Association is also at a potential crossroad with more and increasing pressures on farming, um, including economic, environmental and social. The Grasslands Association therefore has an increasingly important role to play, working more closely with sectors and government to develop and extend a credible evidence base on which farmers and policymakers can make enduring decisions. So thank you once again, and I wish you all well. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Gerald, and thank you, John. And look, that is one of the things we can't replicate when we're on a, a um, online system like that is the physical or the audible acclamation, Gerald. So congratulations. We on mute. We could, there we go. There's always one. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okie dokie, look, I'm sure um, when we come to the end, Warren's gonna have a word or two to say. Um, but for now, our one last little task before we do get to the end, and, and Gerald, you can mute and turn your video off now if you want. We're welcome to stay on our screens um, so people can um, applaud you at home. We're going to hand over to somebody again, I think will be well known in, in grass 